Are y'all ready to get into the scriptures today? All right. If you have your Bibles, there's one primary passage we're going to look at, folks. It's, going to, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. And um, we're still kind of looking at this theme unveiling. And, and, and um, I haven't really uh, had anything mapped out as far as what, mes- what message we were going to look at or what we were going to talk about from Sunday to Sunday. But as I've been reading through the scriptures uh, and um, just the voice of the Spirit, um, we're going to unveil this idea. We're unveiling still. We've been unveiling how the enemy works. We're going to unveil the idea of vows, more specifically inner vows. You know, let me, let me kind of uh, lead us into this this way. Uh, there's this thing that, that happens with birds. It happens with little ducklings. It's called imprinting. How many of you have heard of that? There's that imprinting process, for example, that little ducklings go through. It takes place actually within the first two days of them being born. And the imprinting process for ducklings involves both sight and sound. So they're hearing uh, their mom, they're hearing uh, the other ducks around them, and they're seeing. So it involves both sight and sound. And it's helped, it's, it, the imprinting process accomplishes two things. It helps them understand who they are. They're able to identify who they are. They're also able to identify the, 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 the same species so they know how to pick, how to pick appropriate mates, for example. Um, but that's, that imprinting process really is twofold. It helps, them, uh, it helps them to establish their purpose. And that imprinting process helps establish their connectedness that they're actually connected. I'm a duck. There's the rest of the ducks, right? And as a duck, here's what I do as a duck. Here's how ducks are. Here's how ducks act. Here's act. Here's how they quack. Here's how they walk. Here's how they swim. And so that's what that imprinting process establishes. And again, they typically or primarily use sight and sound to do that. In the same way, the enemy wants to imprint you and I but not for good, but for evil. And sight and sound is involved in that as well. So in other words, there are things because we live in a fallen world. One day Jesus is coming back and I hope it's tomorrow. You know, I guess we'll be raptured first and then he'll come back. But I just hope all this winds up real quick. But one day Jesus is coming back and there's gonna be a thousand year reign where we're not gonna be dealing with the devil or the enemy, and he's gonna set all things right again. Does that, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But for now, we live in a fallen world. And Satan is still still referred to and is the God of this world, little g, the God of this world. And because we live in a fallen world, because he's the God of this world, because evil is allowed and permitted on the earth today, There are times where you and I, where the enemy will take advantage of moments, circumstances, situations to try to imprint us. Where we find ourselves, maybe they're self-inflicted wounds through our own foolishness and and sinful choices, or it might be the result of of the sin and choices of others. But we experience wounds, we experience hurt. As a result, we find ourselves dealing with distrust, anger, cynicism. Satan desires to imprint our souls with these pains because he wants to shape us. In other words, just like a duckling through that imprinting process, that that imprinting process determines how that duck sees itself and how it sees the world around it. You know the enemy wants to use the fallen nature of man, our own sins and the sins of others to imprint our souls as well and take that pain that we experience in life and shape us in such a way that it determines the way we see ourselves and the way we see the world around us and it's not good. Does that make sense, everybody? So often, oftentimes what happens is as a result of that pain, as a result of those times, those moments, those experiences that we have, many, many, many times, most of the time, what ends up happening is we, as a result of that, make these vows. We make these inner vows. Maybe we grew up in a home that was abusive. 
maybe it was abusive emotionally or physically, and we make the, we make the vow, I will never treat my kids that way. I will never spank my children. Maybe if you grow up poor and it's painful and it hurts and it's embarrassing and you're, you're going to school and your clothes just don't look the same as everybody else and they make fun of you and as a child you go through that and you say, I'm never going to be poor again. No way, no way will I ever be poor again in my life. And if I am, I'm, cer- I'm certainly not going to look poor. It's an inner vow. Are y'all following what I'm saying? We get hurt. No one's ever going to hurt me like that again. No one's ever going to treat me that way again. No one's ever going to do that. I'm never going to get used like that ever again. Maybe you were drugged to church as a kid. And you think, when I grow up, I have kids. I'm not dragging them to church every time the doors are open. We make these inner vows. Are you you hearing what I'm saying so far? And we think that those inner vows are healthy. We think they're necessary to protect and defend us. Here's what Jesus had to say about it in Matthew chapter five. He says this, you've also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows, you must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Don't make any. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne, Do not say by earth, because the earth is his footstool. Do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Don't even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. I've discovered that. (laughs) One of our granddaughters are here. They saw a picture of me in in high school, and they said, who's that? That's your pawpaw. Your hair is is black. I know. We can't even control how much hair we have. All right, I know that. He goes on to say, just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Now watch this. Talking about vows. Anything beyond this, anything beyond what? A simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. In other words, I'm not going to make these inner vows. I'm not going to make these promises to myself. I'm not even going to make these these vows to the Lord. Anything beyond that is from the evil one. It's so interesting. Why is making a vow, particularly like the ones that we've mentioned, because folks, I'm telling you, it happens all the time. I guarantee you, most of us in this room have said those words, and many of us are allowing those inner vows to dictate our relationships and dictate our choices in life. I will never be poor again. I'm never going to look poor again. I'm never going to be used again. I'm never, right? Here's why Jesus said it's from the evil one. Let's go back and look at the, 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 the first part. He says, don't make any vows. Don't say by heaven because it's God's throne and don't say by the earth because it's his footstool. Why is making these inner vows that we're talking about, why is that from the evil one? Because when I make a vow like that, what, which we've been, the, what we're talking about, when I make a vow like that, I'm removing God from the throne of that area of my life. If I'm making a vow that has to, in the area of my feelings, I'm never gonna be treated like that, I'm never gonna go through that again, I'm never gonna be used like that again, then I become the emotional boss or God in that area of my life, and I'm kicking God out of that area. I'm not letting him, are you hearing what I'm saying? If it's I'm never gonna be poor again, then I'm, I'm making myself the financial boss of my life, not the Lord. That's why Jesus said, don't make those vows. You're not really defending yourself. You're not really protecting yourself. Here's the thing, inner vows First of all, they cause extremes. It's like a drunk man trying to get on a horse. Keep falling off on one side or the other, but you just can't quite get on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People make inner vows, and inner vows, anytime that we make an inner vow, it usually results, it causes extremes. Maybe our parents were too strong uh, as far as discipline is concerned. I'm never gonna spank my kids. That's the vow we make. I'm never gonna do that. And you don't. But everybody else wants to. (laughs) 
I remember working, not in, in the church, I remember being an employee in a, in a, in a company in, in the private sector, and there was a guy on my team that he was just really, finally I looked at him one time and I said, you were never spanked as a child, were you? Because I can tell you can't function now. You, you thought you were the center of, the, of your own universe then, you still think that. I'm never going to ever be used again. I'm never going to be hurt again. I'm never going to put myself in a position to be hurt ever again. I'll tell you what, that, those kind of vows, there's, that, that, there's nothing but extremes that come from that. I'll tell you this, anytime we say that, we are, that we are absolutely disqualifying ourselves from ever being in the service of the king or his kingdom. Because if you're going to serve God, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be taken advantage of. You're going to be mistreated. You're going to be maligned. You're going to be slandered. I mean, it just comes with the territory. Jesus even said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. You see what I'm saying? We make, we, and why we do this, we feel like we're defend, we have to defend ourselves instead of trusting God to do it. Also, inner vows cause us to be unteachable in those specific areas. Because we've made them out of pain, they're never, you never make healthy uh, uh, decisions or draw healthy lines out of pain, right? You, You know what I'm talking about, right? And I'm not talking about having the appropriate boundaries where you don't let people just, just take advantage of you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about those things that we say to ourselves That really, because an inner vow is a promise that we make that's directed towards a pain that we've experienced and somehow we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. And so again, we overcompensate and then we become unteachable in that area. Somebody tries to address that and we've become armor plated because we're we're concerned that if, if I let my guard down and let wise counsel in, I'm gonna be letting pain in again. So I'd rather just keep my heart armor plated. Just a lot easier. I almost feel like it's like an $80 an hour session, counseling session or something, I don't know. (laughs) Inner vows affect our hearts. What I just said a moment ago, we become become armor plated in the way that we we approach. Our relationships with others, there's, there's a lack of liberty and freedom. Look folks, I'm telling you, The enemy wants to rob you and I of our innocence. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about the sins that you've committed before you came to Jesus or even the sins that you've committed after coming to Jesus, right? I'm saying that the enemy, here's what I mean when I say the enemy wants to rob us of our innocence. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I mean by that. He wants us to become jaded. He wants us to become cynical. He wants us to become uh, sarcastic he wants, us to become, he wants us to take it upon ourselves, to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves, to guard ourselves, and le- uh, 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 as opposed to allowing and trusting God to do that for us. That, that's the innocence I'm talking about. I've met men in ministry, 90 years of age, our founding pastor, 90 years of age. He passed away at 94. Pastor Warren Pearsall, he founded the church here. And so he had so many battle scars in the spirit, it looked like he'd been in a war. But he had a tender heart towards people and towards the Lord. He wasn't cynical. He wasn't jaded. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Sarcasm is just anger turned inward. And here he is, 94 years old, and this guy had been through it. You know, at one time, people were so mad at him at the church. This is a bad church service where they, 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 they sliced his tires in his car. I mean, just weird stuff. People, people do, when the devil gets a hold of people do just weird things. But you talk to him and it's like his heart was tender towards people. He loved the Lord. He loved people. He didn't allow any of that to get into his heart. He didn't allow it to steal his innocence at all. He kept his heart pure before God. How? He refused to make an inner vow that said, I will never put myself in a position where somebody's going to take advantage of me again. Instead, he said, I will always trust the Lord because he is good and he is faithful and he's worthy of my trust. Amen. 
Then I've known people in their 30s and I'm like, you are way too young to be this jaded. (laughs) You've been hurt and you made a vow thinking that that vow was gonna protect you and defend you and instead it's defining you. Satan is imprinting your soul. He wants you to live within the parameters of your own pain instead of live outside of that in the healing and the liberty of the spirit and in the power of the word of God. Does this make sense, everybody? So how do we break those? How do we break the influence of those vows? Well, first of all, number one, we have to recognize them. And and I think probably there's a lot of us here that you probably have already identified, ooh, I think I've made some of those. I think I'm living by some of those, right? You don't have to say right, because I don't want you to have to identify yourself. It's kind of like asking, everybody stand who's in sin right now. That, 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 you know. I'm not saying that. But how do we break the influence of those inner vows? First of all, we recognize them. And I think for most of us, we probably know, even today, we probably be like, hmm, I think, <laughs> I think I recognize one. If not, ask the Holy Spirit. He is so faithful. He will point it out to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Second of all, I'm talking about breaking the influence of interval because we have to, you guys. See, you can trust God with your past. You can trust him with the uncertainty of your future. You can trust him with your pain. You can trust him with your questions. You can trust him with your unsettledness. You can trust him. He is worthy of your trust. You can trust him with the thing you're most afraid of, right? So the second thing we do is once we identify them, we repent. Acts chapter three, verse 19, Peter said this, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Well, you may already be, you and I are are already converted, but there is something super beautiful and powerful in the idea of repentance. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Repent so that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. Guys, Jesus paid for every sin we could ever commit. Over 2,000 years ago, he paid for it. But that doesn't mean that we, never, that we aren't responsible to act or ask for it or receive it. We still have to receive it. If somebody paid off your house and they're trying to hand you the deed to the home, the house is paid for, but you better grab that title deed. You better grab the deed. Put it in your safe. You have to receive it, right? And so the idea of repentance is, 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 is there's this thing where what we need from God. I mean, honestly, if, we're, if, we are, if we've made those kind of vows, the only way that we break the influence of them is first of all, recognize them. But second of all, we have to repent. What does that mean? We have to change our mind. We have to be willing to lay down what we've trusted in to protect and defend us. See, that's repentance. See, repentance isn't making a course correction. Repentance isn't a slight adjustment. By the way, repentance isn't even a sharp right-hand turn, 90-degree turn, left or right. That's not repentance. Repentance is 180. Repentance is I'm going this way in my thoughts and my heart. Now I'm going this way. Repentance means this is the wrong way, and there's no going like this. It's still the wrong way. There's no going, it's, a, there's no go, it's still the wrong way. The only right way is the opposite way. Does that make sense? It means I have to lay down what I've trusted in to protect and defend me. And then here's the third thing that we do to break the influence of those things is we ask for healing. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's so beautiful. Psalm 147, prophetically speaking of Jesus' ministry says, He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. In Luke chapter four, Jesus says, the Lord has anointed me to do what? To heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. Guys, we can't, we're not sufficient to bind up our own wounds. I know this is, 
doesn't seem that deep, but it kind of is. If, you, if, you re- if we really look at what the scriptures are saying, right? What Jesus was saying in Matthew 5 is so powerful. But he still, so we, re- we, we recognize him, we repent, which means we're, we're changing our mind. We're turning literally the opposite direction, which means we have to lay down the things we've trusted in to defend and protect us. And then we ask for what he's provided for us through, his, through the cross and through the empty tomb, his heal, healing, 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 that he binds up the wounds. Right? Isn't it beautiful that Jesus does that? Aren't you thankful that he does that without judging us? Aren't you thankful that he doesn't reprimand us? That even if we have to repent and say, God, I've embraced, uh, I've made an inner vow that's not been right or healthy at all, but now I'm coming to you. Isn't it wonderful that he doesn't just chastise us for having that? And we should say, Lord, I need you to heal my heart. I need you to heal my heart. I need you to bind up the, isn't it good that God doesn't go, what took you so long? What is the matter with you? Know, right? Aren't, isn't that beautiful? We gotta stop. So it's it's so that promise that he makes. There's pieces of our hearts when they're broken that we're not even recognize. We don't even recognize where those pieces are, but the Holy Spirit knows where they are. So when he puts our hearts back together again, he doesn't miss a piece. When we try to do it, we miss several. When he binds up our hearts, our wounds, we miss something, but he doesn't. Oh, that, this may not be the best illustration, but I remember working out, training, and I was doing this thing where you jump up on the edge of the, the uh, gym, the, 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 the ring, boxing ring. And I was tired and I missed the step and I came down on the edge with my shin and sliced it. It was very painful. What made it more painful was Bonnie was out of town, so I felt even more abandoned and... <laughs> So I realized it wasn't stopping bleeding and I realized that I was in a pretty good amount of pain. So I drove home and I tried to butterfly stitch the slice, you know, where you take tape, this, you know, whatever that tape is that white, and you just cut it and make little strips and you try to fold it over and tape it. It was bleeding so much I couldn't even tape it. I'm trying to bind up the wound. It wasn't working. I was bleeding everywhere. I was traumatized. Malachi the dog was traumatized. Everybody was trying. I mean, Bonnie wasn't even there to help me and feel sorry for me. It was horrible. I had to go to the, to the, I had to go to a ER. I actually went to TLC. They bound me up. But a doctor had to go there and he had to give me a shot and, and, I love how they say, they never say this is going to hurt. They say, you're going to feel some pressure. I'm just letting you know, it's code word for it's going to hurt. And, uh, and he stitched that thing up and it was like, oh, that's a lot better than what I was trying to do. We're sitting there using tape, trying to bind up our hearts. Jesus, by the power of his spirit and his word, is able to bind up the wounds and heal the broken heart and make us whole again. He's the only one that can do it. We gotta stop trying to do it ourselves. Amen? Let's all stand as the worship team leads us. You may need, you may need to break the influence of some inner vows today. You may need to experience and ask for that healing that's available. I'm gonna ask you to respond to the Lord by slipping out in the aisle, coming down to the front. For some of you, it may, it may mean I, I need to get baptized today. You may need to make your way to the table of communion where we can remind ourselves of the power of his blood and his broken body. The, the communion tables are open. But I'm, I'm gonna ask, ask you, particularly those of you that know that your life has been directed by these inner vows and you need to break those. I'm gonna ask you as soon as they begin to sing the first note, 
Don't even hesitate. Step out of the aisle. Come down to the front. Let's let Jesus do what he's able to do, what he wants to do, what he has, what he has the power to do, what his love is waiting to do for every one of us. Let's respond to him now. All right? Come on.